Hello and welcome. Welcome to the online inspiring seminar series of Tubitak Research Institute for Fundamental Sciences, which we organize for national and international audiences to mitigate the negative effects of COVID-19 coronavirus outbreak on scientific thoughts and science-based actions. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce our today's very special speaker, Professor Peter Georgius, a very well-known scientist from Harvard University. He has kindly accepted our invitation to join us for this seminar, and he is going to give a great talk on From Inner Space to Outer Space, learning how to study ocean walls by studying Earth's ocean. The talk is part of our interdisciplinary seminar series. At the end of the talk, we will have a session called questions, for questions, where questions can be asked by sending a message through the chat button of the Zoom platform or just by raising hand. Peter Gurgis is a professor of organismic and evolutionary biology at Harvard University. His research resides at the crossroads of microbial ecology, physiology, and biogeochemistry, and as such is highly interdisciplinary. In particular, he uses an appropriate combination of molecular biology as well as physiological and geochemical technique to examine the role of deep sea microorganisms in mediating local and global biogeochemical cycles. He and his lab has developed novel instruments and samples such as high pressure systems to mimic natural environments, novel geochemical sensors, and the water mass spectrometers and microbial samples that enables to better study microbial geochemical relationships. Peter Georgius received his BS degree from the University of California, Los Angeles, his PhD from University of California, Santa Barbara, and did postdoctoral work at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. He joined the Harvard faculty as an assistant professor in 2005 and becoming full professor in 2012. Professor Peter, uh, Peter Georgius has received a number of awards, including five consecutive years of commendations for distinguished teaching the 2007 and 2011 Lindbergh Foundation Award for Science and Sustainability, and 2010 honorable mention in the ENI International Energy and Environment Award. At this point, I want to thank once again, Professor Peter Georgius for joining us and look forward to his talk. Peter, you welcome, please, to begin your talk. Oh, thank you very much for the very kind and generous introduction. Uh, if you will give me a moment, I will get the slides going. Yes, yeah, sure, please. Okay. Uh -huh. I hope everything looks good. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. It's perfect. <laughs> thank you for the wonderful introduction. It's very kind. I am very happy uh, to be here and thank you all for your time. Uh, I do appreciate the invitation. I only wish I could have uh, visited you in person, but perhaps with a, uh, a bit of luck for us all, we can do this. Um, uh, sure. So uh, I am um, a, boy, where shall I start? I shall start with this. Uh, I am a person who grew up in Southern California. Uh, I was sharing earlier that my family is from Egypt and I ended up being born in California, living on the ocean and fell in love with the idea of exploring uh, the ocean, this world around us. As I went through my education, I began to realize that we are not uh, very good, frankly, 
at studying life in the deep sea. We can sail out on a ship, a small boat, a big boat, a big ship, and we can study on the surface. But we cannot really easily study the many extraordinary organisms that live in the deep ocean. One of the things, and I will t- I touch upon some of the tools we've developed to do this, right? But, but the, the other thing that I have realized over the last several years is that there is a growing interest in studying the oceans in our solar system, the other oceans. There are moons around Jupiter and Saturn that have oceans. We're very comfortable, confident, saying there is likely water on these. Now, water is not, um, there is no shortage of water in the universe. Uh, It is finding a liquid ocean on a moon is very exciting. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. But what I hope to share with you today uh, is uh, a bit about the research we do and why we do it and the tools we have developed to do this research and how we are using these oceanographic tools to support the United States um, National uh, Aeronautic and Space Administration or NASA to support them in their mission. Now, I am also, as uh, we was was talking with uh, earlier, I had the, um, I'm excited to of course be speaking with you because Turkey has a long history of doing marine research Uh, and really excellent work uh, in the Black Sea and in the Mediterranean. And as I understand it now, your your president is excited about having Turkey develop a space program or a space presence. Uh, And if I understand correctly, it's been speaking with Mr. Elon Musk about uh, Turkish astronauts and the like. So this is a very exciting time uh, around the world for ocean and space exploration. So... With that being said, um, I will proceed here. Uh, I'd like to start with this slide. This is a quote from an, uh, um, an author. He writes science fiction. And Arthur C. Clarke, uh, this famous science fiction author said, this is, we, it is inappropriate to call our planet Earth when it's clearly ocean. And I love this, it is, it is a fact. The deep sea alone, the deep sea alone is 80% of our planet's living space. This is an amazing number. 80% of any place on Earth that is habitable is deep sea. Well, what is deep sea? That is ocean deeper than a kilometer, which means it is always without sunlight. And very likely it's cold. So I, you know, the typical environment, perhaps uh, let us be silly for a moment. If aliens came to Earth and, and they went back to report on what they found here, they might say, the average habitat on Earth is salt water and it's cold and dark because 80% of our planet's living space is the deep sea. The other 20% is everything else. And that includes all of Turkey, all of the United States, all of the continents, and even the upper kilometer of ocean. So the deep sea is a major part of our planet's biosphere. Now, human beings, uh, frankly, civilizations and humans evolved around the ocean. Uh, but for millennia, we have had, we really had no idea what lived beneath the surface. And it, it wasn't until uh, this expedition, this Challenger expedition of 1872, that humans decided to go and really look for life in the deep sea in a very systematic way. Now, there were some expeditions before this where people started looking for living things in the deep ocean. It was rather controversial. And so this group of scientists, six scientists, uh, 12 officers, and about 120 military service uh, sailors went out on this, uh, on this um, military ship, turned it into a research lab, and began studying the ocean for four years. This is the Challenger expedition. Now, the scientists on board did not have the benefit of Uh, picking up a phone and placing an order for a piece of equipment or walking down the hall, they had to design and build many of their new tools. They built a thermometer that they could lower in the water. And then this is a very smart design. It is a glass tube shaped like a U. So if you can sort of see my finger here and they would lower it in the water. It would measure the temperature 
And then they would flip it over by pulling on a rope and it would preserve the temperature record at that depth. Genius. They made nets, they made water sampling bottles and gas analyzers. And that that all they did this on board the ship. It is amazing to me today that their legacy, their influence is still evident. Today, of course, we still take temperature, a very important part of oceanography, and it is digital, so it's not exactly the same. Our nets have not changed very much. Our water sampling bottles, not changed very much. Even our gas analyzers, they have, of course, become electronic, but the, many of the principles are the same. Why is it, though, that we still use these tools and we know so little about the deep sea in particular? I think it is important to remember that we humans are not adapted to life and water. I cannot put on scuba gear and swim down any deeper than maybe, I don't know, 50 meters, maybe 100 meters if I'm very well trained, but that is it. The pressures are immense in the deep ocean. If you went on a trip to the bottom of the ocean, the deepest part, the pressure on you would be the equivalent of about 50 jumbo jets, the big airplanes that we fly around in. And also many of our tools have not changed. Uh, uh, and this is a, a different talk for another time, but there is not a big economic driver uh, for developing a deep sea tool. So we use many of the same tools, but it's also important to remember the fundamental attribute of water. Water is electromagnetically opaque. And what I mean is that many of the electromagnetic frequencies that we use, um, GPS, uh, Wi-Fi, I am talking to you over Wi-Fi, right? Bluetooth, all of this stuff, none of that works beyond a, a few millimeters or centimeters in water. And light itself is scattered and absorbed as it goes through the ocean. It amazes me to think that I can look at the moon several hundred thousand kilometers away with my bare eyes and with my children. We can stand in the backyard and look at the moon with our bare eyes. I can use a telescope to see a crater, but I cannot see more than maybe a hundred meters in the ocean. Hundreds of thousands of kilometers versus a hundred meters. And that's because of the water. So in order to really advance our understanding of the ocean, we have to spend some time down in the deep sea and we have to find and develop the tools to understand these organisms. Because in the deep ocean, we find some really amazing ecosystems. What you see here are some of the hydrothermal vents that we see uh, 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 that, that are down there in the deepest uh, part of our ocean. Uh, these ecosystems, oops, well, that's okay. I'll, I'll have another movie to show you later. These ecosystems are amazing because they are examples of the diversity and resilience of life. At the hydrothermal vents we study and at the, or at the oil and gas seeps, we see how microbes can make a living off of eating chemicals that are toxic to humans. And in turn, how those microbes can support animals that are biochemically much closer to us. So the, my lab studies what I call the ecological physiology of the marine organisms. We want to understand the biochemistry of these organisms and how they have evolved and adapted to their environment. To do that, we of course employ genomics to look at the genomes or transcriptomics to look at the gene expression. But my lab is known for, and we work very hard at making metabolic rate measurements. We want to understand how fast do these organisms eat? How fast do they release their waste products? Do they change the pH around them? How do they respond to changes in pH? These questions are about how an organism functions. And to do that, we've had to develop technologies to make those kinds of measurements. So I'm going to go through and show you some highlights of our tools, and I hope you will forgive me. I may go a little quickly through some of the tools so I can share a bit more of some of the science with you. But I want to tell you about some of these tools and some of uh, and how we use them for research. It is very important to me to be a part of the global oceanographic community. 
uh, I believe that we have an obligation as scientists to help each other and to help educate and inform the whole world on the, our relationship to the ocean, to understand its role, not only for us, but really running the planet. And because I believe this, I also build all of the tools we build to be open design. And what I mean is, I, I don't build a tool and keep it a secret in the lab. My hope is that I can provide other scientists with the, the blueprints and the designs and the software so that they can build on it, in fact, even improve it, uh, and in turn, share it with the world themselves. So uh, I will talk about some of these tools. For today, I'm going to focus on, on, on really sort of these four here. This mass spec, I'll tell you a little about the isotope analyzer and this lander and some other tools. Uh, and, and please keep in mind that my hope is to uh, further develop these and continue to share them with scientists around the world. But let's start with our mass spectrometer. This is, this is a tool that um, uh, allows us to do some really amazing measurements on the seafloor. Uh, there we go. Excuse me. Oh, wait. It's happening with my slides. There we go. Um, a mass spectrometer, there are many different kinds of mass spectrometers. Uh, this particular mass spectrometer is called a quadrupole mass spectrometer, and it's designed to measure dissolved gases. I started working on this about 15 years ago, a little bit more, actually. And I had been using these gas analyzers, these mass spectrometers, as a PhD student to study deep sea tube worms in the lab and how they breathe. About 15 years ago, companies started making smaller and smaller components, and I thought, you know, I think I can send this to the seafloor. Now, why would I do that? There are many, many important gases that are uh, released by hydrothermal vents and by oil seeps. And let me give you an example, methane. Methane, I, I will talk more about methane. It is a very important gas in the ocean for feeding microbes. It's also very important for our climate. The methane in the deep sea is at such high concentrations around the, the, the vents and seeps, if I bring it up in a water bottle, it bubbles like opening a can of soda, opening a can of Coca-Cola, the bubbles come out. And now my methane measurement is, is wrong. To bring it up at pressure, I have to build a 20,000 US dollar bottle that can hold the pressure. But with the underwater mass spectrometer, I can make the measurements in real time on the seafloor. And believe it or not, the whole mass spectrometer, everything you see here, uh, except for the housing it is in, this also costs 20,000 US dollars. And yes, of course, that is real money and it's not small money, but I have a choice. I can buy a single bottle or I can buy and build this instrument and make hundreds of measurements on the seafloor. So I developed this to allow us to make hundreds of measurements on the seafloor. So we can put it on a robot submarine and use the robot arm to, to take a water sample of high temperature water, we cool it, and then we can measure the dissolved gases. We can measure methane, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and many more. Uh, this is an open design instrument. Um, Scientists in Germany, France, Japan, I think, Germany, France, Japan, uh, and other US nations, and I'm missing a country, I'm sorry, uh, but have built these for themselves now. They've reached out to my lab, we've provided them with drawings and uh, some guidance, and they are building and running their own and improving on it. So I'm very excited about that. And this is just uh, examples of how we use the instrument. Um, sorry for the many words, but the idea is I can go down to a hydrothermal vent, these beautiful vents you see here, and I can use the robot submarine to make a geochemical map. I can make measurements all along this over several hours and come back with a geochemical map. And if I integrate the concentrations and if I measure the flux, the fluid flux coming out of this, 
I can start to estimate how much hydrogen is being eaten by microbes, or I can estimate how much methane is being made by some other microbes. So it's a very powerful tool for making a quantitative, uh, for doing quantitation of gases in the seafloor. Another example from our mass spec where we can go through and make these measurements and again, try to understand what microbes are eating the methane or producing it, or even what animals might be consuming oxygen, for example, and so on. Now, switching gears a little bit, and I will start to go a bit faster. We also look at isotopes. And as many of you know, I imagine, um, the isotopes are important in telling us about the origins of a gas. So for example, methane has different amounts of carbon-13 in its, if it's made by microbes ver, or if it's made by a volcano. So we developed an isotope analyzer that allows us to measure the isotopes also on the seafloor. And we go down and it, very much like the mass spectrometer, we can collect methane bubbles or gas bubbles and start understanding how much methane comes from microbes and how much from the volcano. This is important too, because the volcanic um, methane sources are, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's an abiotic reaction, but methane made by microbes is a biological process. And we want to understand how sensitive those biological processes are to our changing world, to increase temperature, changes in pH and so on. So some examples again of the data. And finally, I want to tell you about these devices. These are called microbial fuel cells and they are very interesting devices. There are many microbes that live in marine sediments that are capable of breathing iron oxides or rust. And I'll say that again. In many marine sediments, there are microbes that can breathe rust. Uh, imagine, for example, instead of breathing oxygen, you could breathe rust. Now, the, pro the challenge here is rust is a solid. And so the, the microbes that can breathe rust have evolved the ability to breathe the rust outside of their cell. So again, imagine now you uh, eat your, you know, sandwich or your baklava or whatever it is, and you you don't breathe in oxygen, but you take your hand and you touch it to a rusty plate. And that is your oxygen substitute. There are microbes that do that. Over the last 20 years, scientists that I've worked with and many others, we have been developing a way to collect electricity from those microbes. And the way we do it is we put a conductive surface and bury it in the mud. And the microbes then uh, we, we, we trick them into thinking this conductive surface is an iron oxide. And so they put their electrons from the organic matter they eat onto there and produce an electrical current. So we are literally generating uh, electricity from microbial activity on the seafloor. What's very exciting is we have been developing these systems to take the electricity and power sensors, little sensors, oxygen sensors, and fluorometers, uh, other sensors to study the deep ocean using systems that are powered by microbes. I also mentioned to you that Wi-Fi does not work underwater and Bluetooth doesn't work underwater, but we can communicate acoustically. We can use sound, which travels very well through water. And we have been putting uh, devices called acoustic modems on these. And that allows us to transmit data from one to the other. And so we have been building wireless seafloor observatories that talk to one another. Uh, this is a project that is still being developed, but I believe there is some really exciting potential because um, these devices are not very expensive. And what, uh, again, if any of you are interested, we can talk about how to build these. Um, they are simple and reliable. Do not think they are producing many, many watts of power. I cannot run, for example, a coffee maker off of this. Uh, but in the deep sea, also remember, we have no solar power and we have no electrical extension cords or no electrical grid. 
some people ask me, how much electricity do you get? Well, the answer is the system you're looking at here uh, produces milliwatts continuously. And some people say, oh, that's too little. But let me explain one more thing. You know, if you buy a battery in the United States, we call them a D size battery, a D battery. You know, you put it in a flashlight. The amount of electricity we can harness with this system over one year is what you would get out of 130 D batteries. It's pretty good. So if you can start thinking of devices you could power off of a D battery, a temperature sensor, an optical sensor, even this acoustic modem, you can power them with these microbial fuel cells by managing the electrical power. So it's a very exciting tool for management and observation. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about this. This is perhaps our most advanced system so far. This is a device that NASA has funded. They funded my lab to build this. This is, um, we call it the Autonomous Biogeochemical uh, In-Situ Sensor and Sampler. It's a big, long name, but uh, or nickname it the abyss, which is another word for the deep sea. Um, this is about a two meter by two meter by three meter uh, device that we deploy off of a ship to the seafloor with lots of batteries and all of our most advanced sensors to study the, the ocean ecosystem. In a way, this device is, is like I took my whole lab and made it waterproof and sent it to the seafloor. Why did NASA want us to do this? NASA works in space and they know very well how to study processes in space. They know very well how to study processes on the moon or on Mars, but they ocean, but water is their enemy. <laughs> when I talk to NASA engineers and I say, I put a mass spectrometer in the water, they look at me like I'm crazy. Of course, I look at them and admire their work, but they do not know how to work in water. So NASA funded me and my colleagues to build this system so that we can develop robotic, tools that they might use on the ocean worlds. Now, this is so big and heavy, of course, they would never send this, but we are developing sensors and we are developing software and we are understanding which tools are most important and why. And that is really critical. The other thing we are focusing on is communicating underwater. Again, remember, Wi-Fi does not work, Bluetooth does not work. And remember, we can also talk to the, the, the spacecraft on Mars. It takes nine minutes to get here, but we still talk to them all the time. If NASA puts something in an ocean around Jupiter, they cannot use the same technology. So a lot of what they did is funded us to develop these technologies. I'm going to ignore most of these uh, just in the interest of time so I can share some science. But I want to tell you about one technology called an optical modem. Now, many of you who are maybe my age probably uh, had a, a computer where you had to dial a phone number to connect to the internet, right? This was before cell phones and Wi-Fi. That is a modem. Uh, I mentioned acoustic modem underwater. That is a modem that, that makes noise and sends it through the water. We're developing an optical modem. This is a device that uses light to communicate underwater at broadband speeds. It's absolutely amazing because it is now high fidelity Wi-Fi communication through light. And that has been a major game changer because it allows us to communicate video and images wirelessly. And that's what NASA is excited about. NASA, of course, cares about methane because those gases are found, we believe, on many of those outer moons. So our first research project is deploying the abyss to methane sites. And so now I want to tell you a bit about our science here. But before I do that, I'm going to show you a picture of the lander. We lower it from the side of the ship and it falls down on its own. We put down two submarines one of them can come here and look at it, and the other one is taking the picture. Um, we make sure it's operational, and then we leave, and it runs like a robot on the seafloor on its own. So I just love this picture. This is a very rare picture to have a submarine, a robot sub, take a picture of another robot sub. Um, 
but it's really the data we're after. And methane is coming out of our seafloor um, from these gas vents and other natural features. This is natural, guys. No, no, this is not something humans have caused. Uh, it's methane produced by microbes that comes up out of the seafloor. Now, scientists have been counting bubbles for many years or trying to count the number of bubbles to estimate the methane flux. But when you are out with a robot submarine in a ship, you can only stare at these bubbles for so many hours and then you have to leave because the robot sub and the ship cost typically 60 to 70,000 US dollars a day. That is not cheap. So our first mission for the abyss was to deploy it at one of these bubble sites, put the probe in the gas stream and use the mass spec to look at the composition of the methane and how much methane is coming out. On our very first deployment at this methane seep, we put it down and then we got some data that said the methane has stopped. So we went down and there it is. So the methane bubbling is not continuous. That's already interesting information. And then of course it starts up a little bit. Let me show you some of the data. Do not worry about the, 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 the concentrations, please. Just focus on the pattern, okay? What we're seeing up here, um, this pattern is the dissolved oxygen. This pattern uh, is dissolved oxygen from a different sensor. And the blue one is the methane. So our abyss is sitting there sniffing on water from the seafloor. Let me go back. It is sniffing here and there's very little methane, just the oxygen that's typical in the surrounding water. And then all of a sudden it starts bubbling again. Boom, it goes up. The first thing that happens is the oxygen goes down, which is much more dramatic than we thought. And we're looking now at how much methane this represents so we can better quantify the methane flux. What was really exciting though, is that at the same time the methane shot up, we measured a lot more nitrogen. This tells us that the bubbles that are coming out are not pure methane. Now we've known that for a long time. We know that sometimes they have ethane and propane and they, sometimes they have um, a little bit of nitrogen, but we're, we're seeing a lot more nitrogen than we thought, five, 10, maybe 15%. What does that mean? Well, it means we cannot simply count bubbles and estimate, assume that they're all methane but then our estimate is 15% off. It also may tell us something about how deep the methane comes from. And here's what's exciting, folks. We, we ha don't have an answer here yet, but imagine you have a methane bubble 10 meters below the seafloor. As it moves through the seafloor, other gases are diffusing in, including nitrogen. So what if a bubble that has 15% nitrogen originated at a greater depth than a bubble that has 5% nitrogen. I believe that's true. And it may help us understand the origins of the methane deep in the subsurface and understand it without having to drill a hole or without having to try and somehow measure it 50 meters down. So we're trying to use the nitrogen to understand the origins of the methane. So that is some of our early data. And right now, we are preparing for a deployment in a place called the Santa Barbara Basin. Now, those of you who are interested in astrobiology should read about the Santa Barbara Basin. Uh, it is not as exciting as the Black Sea, in my opinion. My, my dream is to spend every summer on the Black Sea, but that's just me. Uh, but the Santa Barbara Basin is an anoxic basin that remains anoxic for long periods of time and then turns over and becomes anoxic again. And it's an opportunity to study the microbes that live in this anoxic basin and to also understand the tolerance of animals. So we are deploying the abyss in the Santa Barbara basin in about three months. Uh, and um, I, you know, am excited for that deployment. Uh, and, you know, if you are interested in hearing more, uh, just feel free to email me and ask about how this is going. Um, so I will leave the abyss alone now and tell you a little bit more about, about methane again uh, and focus a little bit more on the microbiology. 
Now, the study site I'm going to share here is off of Los Angeles. And I did use the abyss at this site to generate some of the data that you're going to see. But the more important story, the more important thing is this. This location is about four kilometers offshore, off of Los Angeles, where I grew up and I used to go swimming and sailing a little bit, just four kilometers. And it is about 700 meters deep. And it is what we call a methane seep, where methane is coming out and we see lots of microbial uh, mats, you know, microbial, like it's like a microbe carpet growing. What's amazing about this methane seep is that it is 1.4 kilometers long and about two to 300 meters wide, like a big yellow carpet. And nobody knew it was there. Off the coast of Los Angeles, in the uh, near California there, the waters are so heavily fished and so heavily traveled that we have maps. We have more maps of that area than just about anywhere else in the United States, underwater maps. So it's been very well studied. And still, we missed this 1.4 kilometer seep. Are you kidding? So it shows you how little we still know about the deep sea. I, I, I joke about this, I call it our deep sea backyard because it's right there. Now, when we went to the seep, we found some things we have never seen elsewhere except in the Black Sea. And that is these, we call them chimneys. Uh, these are about a half a meter to two meters tall. And they look like, um, like what you see in a cave, you know, the sort the, the, the cave carbonate deposits. And we wanted to, and we knew there was a lot of methane coming out here and we wanted to measure the, the microbes that ate the methane. That's the purpose of the study. And the conclusion I will tell you now is that the methane, the microbes that eat methane here are eating it so much faster than we have ever seen anywhere in the world. It's, and it, even more than the Black Sea, but the two are very similar. So why is it that the Black Sea, which also has these chimneys, and this site that has these chimneys, why are we measuring such high rates of methane oxidation by microbes? That's the story. Now, as a reminder, methane is a very potent molecule. It has played a very long role in the history of Earth. Uh, it may have even played a role in some extinctions, although this is a debated topic. But methane is a very good greenhouse gas, and the deep sea is the world's largest deposit of methane. There is somewhere between 500 and 2,000 gigatons of methane made largely by marine microbes on the seafloor. And the methane escapes through these seeps. Sometimes it comes out as big bubbles, sometimes as little bubbles, sometimes no bubbles. Uh, and we're finding more and more methane leakage all over the place. But here's what's amazing, my friends. In general, very little methane actually leaves the ocean. This is crazy. When we count all the methane bubbles and we estimate how much methane is coming out, it's gone. To our knowledge, it's being consumed by microbes because methane as a molecule is very chemically stable. In environments without oxygen, we believe that uh, a group of microbes called um, methanotrophic archaea are eating this methane and probably doing it in collaboration, I suppose, with microbes called sulfate-reducing bacteria and others. And we know the chemical stoichiometry looks something like this. I'm not going to talk too much about this. This is for the biogeochemists and microbiologists uh, in the audience. But in general, we know that one methane uh, is consumed for every sulfate that is consumed, and they produce bicarbonate, bisulfide, and water as a byproduct. And here's what's interesting. One, thermodynamically, if you can find a way to reduce the concentrations of the products, you can favor the forward reaction. So you can make something go faster if you can figure out how to pull these down. Now, bicarbonate here can precipitate into carbonate if there's enough calcium and other molecules available. And this is what 
led us to think about those, um, sorry, let me go the other direction real quick. This is what led us to think about these chimneys. When we first found these chimneys, we realized that they are largely carbonate and that maybe this could make the methane oxidation go faster. So let me go back to my slide, thank you. So in the lab, we have high pressure vessels and other devices that we can recreate the conditions we find on the seafloor. So to make this story, keep it short, we brought some samples back and we incubated them at pressure and we looked at the rate of methane consumption using isotopes. Please don't worry too much about the, the exact rates, but this is the number of methanes oxidized in nanomoles per cubic centimeter. And these are samples that are very typical of the deep sea. So all of these numbers are very typical deep sea. So let's just say it's 40,000, 40,000 nanomoles. When we look at the samples from the site called Point Doom off of California, we are now up in the 300, 400, 500, 600,000, an order of magnitude more than what we see down here. <coughs> Excuse me. We also see that when we put the Black Sea data on here, the Black Sea hovers right about here. And so something about these carbonate chimneys is really making a big difference. Now, I had a chance to make a little three-dimensional video here of this carbonate chimney. I want you to see what it looks like up close. Uh, so again, this is about a meter and a half tall. And this video was taken from the robot submarine uh, where we took a lot of pictures and we stitched them together to make a video. But you can see as we fly around this, uh, and ignore the stars, by the way, there are no stars in the deep sea. But as you can see, as we fly around this, that it looks, I want to use the word <coughs> organic, you know, it's a, it, it is formed in a very non-crystalline way. Um, but it is in fact carbonate <coughs> with a lot of bio, uh, biopolymer, a lot of mucus holding it together. Uh, this is just a close-up of the surface of one of these uh, chimneys showing you some of the other microbes that live there. But what was really exciting, and I'll move through this fast again, but we started using microscopy to look at the carbonate. This is just a reflected light image. We used a technique called FISH, or fluorescence in situ hybridization. So anything that's in red here is the methane oxidizing archaea. Anything in green is the sulfate reducing bacteria. And we see these very, very, very high densities of them. And forgive me if um, it's hard for you to see between red and green. I apologize for that. But it is um, uh, amazing to see this high biomass. What was really amazing too, is we saw a lot of the uh, mineral pyrite. Now pyrite is iron sulfide and it is electrically conductive. Now I mentioned before, there are microbes that can take their electrons from eating organic matter and putting it on iron oxide, we believe many of these methanotrophic archaea can take the electrons from methane and put it outside on a solid or give that electron to their partner. So if that's true, this mineral pyrite, which we found in high abundance around these microbes, may act like a conductive network. If you want microbes to work together to oxidize methane and chemically reduce sulfate, they either have to be touching or they have to have some way to send electrons from here or food or whatever it is to this other organism. And we think pyrite may be playing a role in that. So I know that this is a, you know, there's a lot of complexity here. But what's amazing is that in these chimneys, as is true in the Black Sea, we find these extraordinary communities of microbes that have physically helped assemble a structure, like an apartment complex in a way, that they live in that seems to enhance their metabolic activity. Something about this chimney, this physical structure, is helping them do their job. So right now, 
our work is continuing to understand what's happening in those chimneys, but also more general to understand how our changes in our planet are going to influence these methane eating microbes. Are they going, are we going to see increases in methane production? What about consumption? And so on. So that we have a, a lot of interest in this topic. Now, as I wrap up, I, I just want to remind us all that as we think about worlds beyond Earth, it's important to remember that there really is water elsewhere in the universe. In fact, this picture is of a, uh, this cartoon, is, which is you know an illustration, is designed to remind us that some quasars out there have so much water, it's 140 trillion times the water in our ocean. And on the right here, you see Earth uh, in scale, at scale with these moons. And some of these moons harbor oceans that are much deeper than our own. This little moon up here in Celadus has an ocean that may be three to five times deeper than Earth and about the same volume of water. So Europa, another uh, moon that very likely has some kind of liquid ocean. Titan uh, has uh, lakes of methane, which is amazing to think about. Now, are we gonna find life on these outer worlds? I don't know. I have no idea. But here's the question. What if we can go to these ocean worlds and observe that in fact, the, chem the conditions there could support life on earth? that we find on Earth today? What if the ocean in Enceladus is habitable? That's a very interesting question, isn't it? And it helps us understand the likelihood uh, that maybe there was a time when Mars, when Mars was warmer and very likely had liquid water, maybe it helps us understand habitability and where microbial life could, could also be found. So that to me is the question. I, I think going and looking for, I don't know, fish or dolphins is nonsense, but I, understanding the conditions we find on these moons is, ex, is a very exciting. And is there a chance we'll find microbes? I don't know. I will not bet my house on it, but I think that understanding the geochemistry is the first step to understanding habitability. Um, I'll skip this slide in the interest of time. I want to thank members of my lab um, whose names are here. We have a tradition every year of dressing up like a movie and taking a silly picture uh, as a kind of holiday card. So they, my lab decided they wanted to dress up as Star Wars. So we did Star Wars and they made me the, the evil emperor, of course. But uh, I, you know, I love my lab. They are incredibly smart, uh, very bright. In fact, over here, this is Dr. Arda Goulet, uh, a scientist from Turkey who has worked in my lab for two years, doing some amazing work on microbes that are capable of this electron transfer. Uh, and I want to thank the funders as well. Uh, and I'll stop there and give you a chance for questions. So thank you. Thank you very much for this extraordinarily exciting and comprehensive talk. And I will say even unusual in general sense. You're very uh, welcome. Please ask questions. <clears throat> Sorular, arkadaşlar, soru sorun lütfen. And uh, yes, please yeah, friends we, also- We will be waiting for message and maybe someone will ask uh, questions. Yes, uh, and please, please do not be shy. Um, yeah. I, there are many things that I have to learn from you. So, and, and we are here to learn from each other. So please ask anything. Peter, I, I want to ask, maybe I will be first uh, some questions. You know, uh, some nations activated research on source, source pole Antarctica over the last years. Have you some uh, project or idea in this sense, or can one use this open design uh, instruments you, you showed here uh, in, in that investigations? Or what do you think all about this uh, in, in, in scientific sense? Uh, may I ask you to, uh, the investigation of what? It was a little broken. Uh, this 
open design uh, instrument, uh, what you showed here, uh, can one use this one also in in that investigation, in, in the source pole investigations, Antarctica and so on, where temperature is very low? Oh, yes. Um, one of the projects that we have been asked to uh, contribute to is in uh, building the mass spectrometer to study processes in the South Pole and the and the uh, um, subsurface lakes, like you know, of course, Lake Baikal is one. Um, but yeah, so we uh, the answer is yes. The nice thing about this instrument <laughs> is that the components are commercially available. And this is important for me because if I make a custom instrument, it becomes very expensive for anyone else, including me, yeah? So it's commercially available, but they are also designed for industry. Uh, so they can operate um, quite easily to minus 20 degrees Celsius. They also sell heating jackets for them uh, because some people use these at temperatures of minus 80. So again, if, if there is no shortage of electrical power, say you are doing this at the South Pole at a research station. Um, so for example, I know Turkey has a polar station. Uh, yeah. That is, that is fine. Yeah. As long as there's, you know, maybe the instrument runs on about uh, 80 watts. And mm -hmm. so it's like a, an old fashioned light bulb. Um, so yeah, there, that should be okay. Uh, you do have to keep it warm if you go below minus 20. Mm -hmm. More questions, please. Yeah, anything. All right, message, so chat button. Does anybody want to go on a research cruise and do a deep sea dive? <laughs> Let's see if that provokes some questions. Ah, here we go. So please go ahead and ask your question. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Um, it's Gizam. Hi, Gizam. Mm, hello. Um, I want to ask Juan. Uh, I just wondered that, um, how do you test your devices in lab for high pressures? Ah, this is a great question. How do we test our devices in lab for high pressure? <clears throat> I, I have um, two answers, and I think uh, it is important to share both. So one is there are many industrial companies around the world that do pressure testing because it's important for oil and gas and lots of industrial processes. But Gizem, the more important thing to realize is many of you have access to pressure equipment in some way, but may not think of it as pressure equipment. For example, many universities have an HPLC, the, uh, the high pressure liquid chromatography, sometimes in a facility. Most of those HPLCs are capable of generating pressures of around 300 uh, to 300 atmospheres or about, you know, maybe a 35 megapascal or something like that. That is, that is how I do it when I started the lab and I didn't have money. Um, not a lot anyway, I had money for salaries but I had to find ways to buy equipment. I went on eBay, I did, and I bought old HPLC pumps for about a hundred US dollars because they could generate the 300 atmospheres. And I tested the most critical components in the laboratory with that. And then used those data to ask the Science Foundation for money to build the instrument. Does that help? I don't know, Gizem, if that's the question. Okay. Gizem? You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I, I can answer questions about the animals or the ecosystems or the technology. Um, Please ask questions. So we have two chats for questions. 
Yeah. Is anybody, if I may ask a question then, uh, may I ask, uh, is anybody on this call uh, doing work in the Black Sea? Or interested in that? So many people uh, participate through this YouTube, Facebook, so, so they cannot contact Oh, directly. they cannot, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they may come to Zoom I, as I well. Well, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, so those of you who may be listening in on Facebook or YouTube, you are uh, welcome to send me an email. Um, if you search for my name, you can find our university uh, mm -hmm. site, uh, and um, I, will, I will do my best to answer your questions. But I do thank you all for the time. I really appreciate you being here. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, someone asked about the Black Sea. How will these studies evolve in the broadest sense? Uh, I, I believe, um, for, for me, the, the Black Sea is a very interesting uh, world uh, treasure in many ways uh, because it is home to very many unique microbial processes. Uh, in the past, scientists have worked uh, to get a permit to work in the Black Sea, leaving out of Turkey. Um, in my opinion, I would like to see the scientific community become much more um, collaborative. Uh, uh, let me give you a quick example. I had a research cruise four years ago uh, in the South Pacific, and we were in the waters of the nation of Tonga. And we, of course, Tonga requires that we bring out an observer, which is fine and in fact, great. But unfortunately, the observer that came out was an economist. And I, would, I think we could be much better as a global community of inviting Tongan scientists on the cruise. This was true in the, many of the Black Sea expeditions. They have, of course had to get permission from Turkey and bring out a Turkish scientist, one or maybe a Turkish government official, but I would love to see us work more collaboratively with an equal number of Turkish scientists and maybe US and European scientists and try and use our collective expertise to work on these questions. So to me, I would love a Black Sea expedition that originated with Turkish scientists and the, it wasn't just a bunch of American scientists coming out on a ship with one Turkish scientist. That's my opinion. So I hope uh, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I we see have a, one question from YouTube from Dovacan yeah. Özcan. Can you re read this? I will happily read it. Uh, are there carbonate chimneys in the Black Sea like you showed? If there is, have they been imaged before? And what is their microbiological composition? This is a great question. Uh, it, there are chimneys that are similar to these, they are bigger. Uh, they have been studied primarily by scientists at the Max Planck Research Institution for Marine Microbiology in Bremen, Germany. Uh, they, the scientists there have collected samples 15 years ago or so and have been working to grow some of the microbes. But the composition, I think, is quite similar to these off of California. The Blacks, another question is why is it unique? Uh, it is due to its semi-closed nature and it is stratified. This means below a certain depth, there is no oxygen. And the microbes I'm talking about require uh, an environment without oxygen. The oxygen is too problematic for them. So the Black Sea is unique because of the no oxygen. Thank you for the questions, those are great. Any others? Okay. Oh, I see. 
Uh, BC Canbeter, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, in your exhibitions, you probably have seen, uh, uh, um, in your expeditions, you probably have seen a lot of deep sea creatures. I wonder what was the most interesting one you have ever seen. Um, this is always the most difficult question for me to answer. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, so uh, I would say for me personally, the most interesting animal is the tube worm that lives at the deep sea hydrothermal vents. Uh, its name is Riftia. I will type the genus and species name in the chat. Uh, I studied this worm for my PhD. The reason I think it is so amazing is because it is one of the fastest growing animals on the planet. Uh, this worm reaches about a meter and a half in length and is about in diameter, um, maybe almost four centimeters, three to four centimeters. And it is in the deep sea, many animals are like jelly, you know, um, but this animal feels like a thick German sausage. I know this is a weird example, but it's very robust. This animal grows so fast, but it has no mouth, no digestive tract, no gut. Instead, it has billions of microbes deep inside its body that it cultures and it gets crazy. The worm takes up hydrogen sulfide from the vent water, which is poisonous to the worm and to you and me, takes it up, sticks it onto a hemoglobin, also unusual, takes it to the bacteria, and the bacteria use the sulfide to do what plants do, convert carbon dioxide to sugars. It's a very amazing symbiosis and an extraordinary example of an animal changing all of its body so it can be a kind of farmer and grow these microbes to feed itself. Unbelievable. That's my maybe my favorite. Oh, look at you, deep sea farmers. Yeah, great minds think alike. <laughs> Thank you, BC. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for joining us, coming and joining us for this very interesting seminar. I hope that uh, we will continue our uh, co connection in future as well and meet in person you here in, in Turkey. I hope so too. And uh, if that opportunity presents itself, I would love to bring some of the equipment and uh, let you all see it, uh, do a little workshop on how to use it and how to use yeah. this kind of equipment. Um, Thank you very much. We appreciate it very much. It is a pleasure for us. The pleasure it, is mine. We can do Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Thank you again, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. And you too as well. All right. Bye, folks. Thank yeah. you.